The Holy Gospel according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord. Within a few days of having been visited by the angel, Mary set out and hurried to the hill country to a town of Judah, where she entered Zechariah's house and greeted Elizabeth. As soon as Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. But why am I so favored that the mother of the Messiah should come to me? The moment your greeting reached my ears, the child in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who believed that what our God said to her would be accomplished. Mary said, My soul proclaims your greatness, O God, and my spirit rejoices in you, my Savior. For you have looked with favor upon your lowly servant, and from this day forward, all generations will call me blessed. For you, the Almighty, have done great things for me, and holy is your name. You, your mercy reaches from age to age for those who fear you. You have shown strength with your arm. You have scattered the proud in their conceit. You have deposed the mighty from their thrones and raised the lowly to high places. You have filled the hungry with good things while you have sent the rich away empty. You have come to the aid of Israel, your servant, mindful of your mercy, the promise you made to our ancestors, to Sarah and Abraham and their descendants forever. Mary stayed with Elizabeth about three months and then returned home. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord. As a content note, uh, for the first just couple minutes of this sermon, I'm going to talk about homophobia and right-wing media. It's been kind of a hard week. I just have to get that out in the open first thing. After a full and vibrant weekend last weekend, where we celebrated Las Posadas and raised over $3,000 for a refugee family, we heard preaching on joy and the art and experience of drag from seminarian Aaron. We got together in a town hall to connect with one another and reflect on our church community. We posted about all of these things on our social media, as we always do, to tell the story of our community. And one thing in particular got a ton of negative attention. A church invites their seminarian to preach and drag. People I have never met, who don't know St. Luke's and who live in other parts of the country, hundreds of people went out of their way to come over to our Facebook and Twitter, our email inboxes, our website, to spread hateful messages about Aaron, about me, about LGBTQIA people in general, about us, St. Luke's, and about any church who would allow such visible queerness, such freedom of gender expression to be shared from the pulpit. To be very clear, I'm not talking about anyone who has questions about drag or someone who's curious because they aren't used to this kind of thing. Raising those kinds of questions or tensions Coming from a place of openness is all good. It is all a part of learning, and we're all still learning how to be together as a community. I'm talking about something different, right? I'm talking about the use of slurs, the threat of hell, blatant anti-Semitism directed towards us by conspiracy theorists, all because homophobia, transphobia, misogyny are alive and well in the world. And our little city church has a brave seminarian who took the risks of sharing the gifts of spirit theology with us, using his own self as an example. As a very important disclaimer, I want to ask you to please not like pick up your phones right now and jump to our defense on social media. The advice we're getting from people with experience in this area is just to let this fizzle out and not to escalate it by trying to push back. Please do pray for Aaron and for all LGBTQIA plus people, for inclusion, affirmation, and justice in our church and in the world. And I'm happy to talk more about the situation with any of you who have more questions or concerns, you know how to get in touch with me. I'll, I'll be here all day. <laughs> I wanted to share this with you because to know the truth is important, 
It is important to know that this is the kind of thing that queer leaders and women leaders and leaders of color in our church go through. It is important to know that there are forces in the world who don't want a place like this to exist. It is important to know the honest truth about the brokenness of this world because it is into this very world with all its weariness that we are about to welcome Christ. In only a few days, we celebrate Christmas, this wild and surprising mystery that God chooses to show up here. Not because God thought it would be great, like a vacation where he got the wrong, you know, travel pamphlet. God chose to live here with us, knowing full well how hard it is to be a person in this world sometimes how brutal and cruel we can be to other humans, how sometimes things seem so tangled and so polarized and so hopeless that it is hard to believe this world can be saved at all. God knows the truth about us and about all this human situation, and God comes towards us in love and vulnerability. That means that we don't have to pretend that things are all right, either from the pulpit or from anywhere else, or try to make things better in order to receive God's love and grace. God has seen it all and knows it all, and God is saying, hold on, I am coming. I'm on my way to you. When we hear the story of Mary and Elizabeth, we remember that the God of the universe could have chosen any number of ways to make God's entrance into the world. Could have come with power and might, could have snapped God's fingers to destroy God's enemies in an instant. And how did God choose to come? In an unexpected pregnancy? First announced to Mary in private, and now confirmed by a pregnant Elizabeth. Two poor women, each with bodies that in their different ways weren't acting according to plan. God was welcomed into the world with a baby's knee to Elizabeth's ribcage, erupting in this laugh or cry that came out as a blessing. Blessed are you among women. This was a huge moment. Elizabeth calls Mary the mother of my Lord, the mother of the Messiah, which makes Elizabeth the first person besides Mary to know and confirm that Mary's child, Jesus, will be the Messiah. And yet, for such a huge moment, this was a tiny moment one like countless others shared between two women in the doorways of their houses in need of one another's wisdom and support. Isn't that just like God, to show God's enormous power in such small moments? To bless Mary, not with wealth or status or fame, but with the gentle touch of her friend. We know this to be true, that God shows God's power in upside down ways. Some people might think that the way God saves the world is through mass media campaigns or by quoting Bible verses at people or by threats of condemnation, but we have experienced God's blessings in cozy meetings in church basements, in smiles felt through masked faces, in bundled up gatherings at the Eagle Monument, in a bunch of small donations becoming $3,000 for a family in need. And isn't it just like God to choose someone like Mary? She was not special or well-known. She was poor and a woman and young and unmarried. You've walked by dozens of people like her on the street and don't give her a second glance. Her only resume was her willingness to be part of God's story. We know this to be true, that God does not choose the powerful or the rich or the mighty to enact God's salvation, but God chooses the ordinary, the small, the unexpected. Some people might think that in order to be blessed by God, you have to look a certain way or act a certain way. There are lists and lists of ways that it's not okay to be, rules that you have to follow, threats and names, and sideways looks for those who step out of the lines and are too gay or too feminine, or too pregnant, or too neurodiverse, or too fill in the blank. But we have experienced God's blessings in some pretty weird people. <laughs> there was that time that we played Dungeons and Dragons as a way of practicing discipleship during a pandemic. 
or the time that someone dressed up as John the Baptist and made a mess with honey. <laughs> there are kind of weird announcements on Sunday sometimes and weird outfits that some of us wear to church. And there's a seminarian preaching in drag and a building that doesn't always work how it's supposed to. And we are blessed because we have known God in each of these small, weird, ordinary, or unexpected people. So it makes sense that God chose Mary. And you know what? Mary knew it. She knew that it was just like God to do something like this because she knew God's story, what God had done throughout history. She knew the story of Miriam, how she sang her people across the Red Sea, and they, with not a single weapon, were safe from all of Pharaoh's army. She knew Deborah's song, how God won military victory through an ordinary housewife named Jael, who Deborah called most blessed of women, in an echo of what Elizabeth would call Mary. She knew Hannah's song, who rejoiced upon learning that she could be part of God's story by being the mother of Samuel. So it makes total sense that God would choose an ordinary woman's home to be the concert hall for the debut of Mary's song of praise that would reverberate through the ages, sung by choirs and shouted in protest, yes, banned by governments and whispered at evening prayer. Mary sings, echoing those women in God's history, but making this song her own now in the present, Mary sings, my soul magnifies you, O God, and my spirit rejoices in you. You have looked with love on me, ordinary and humble as I am, and that is just like you to do. Your mercy is for your people from generation to generation. You have shown strength with your arm. You have scattered the proud. You have put down the mighty from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. You have filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. You have always helped your people because you remember your promises, the ones from of old that are still for us today and forever. Blessed is Mary who believed what God told her, knew that God meant it and God would fulfill. And blessed are you who wait for Christmas with longing for the love and joy of God. You know how desperately this weary world needs a savior. We know to be true that God has saved and is still saving us. And this salvation is coming in unexpected ways, in a cradle and on a cross. And it is turning the world upside down. 